selected for his title, his topic for us this evening, Before the End of the Day, Before the End of the Day, Brother Tom. Thank you, Brother Jerry. I appreciate that beautiful thought of when there's peace in Jerusalem, there will be peace worldwide. Thank you for that thought. I uh, bring you the love and greetings of our Ecclesia, the Southern Wisconsin Bible students. We meet in Sunday, on Sunday in Janesville, Wisconsin, and weeknights at our home in Middleton, Wisconsin. And uh, uh, Eric and Natasha, who many of you know, wanted especially to be remembered to you. I remember hearing a discourse many years ago by Homer Hamlin, Brother Homer Hamlin, entitled The Trial of Jesus. And in it, he described a long list of abuses and legal injustices committed against Jesus during the final days of his life. What is truly remarkable is the fact that according to the Bible record, Jesus did not become angry uh, toward those who were mocking him, abusing him, Throughout much of his interrogation by the chief priests, he said not a word in his defense. When he was on the cross and taunted by the soldiers to save himself, if he truly was the son of God, he didn't answer them. Throughout his ministry, Jesus was mocked, insulted, taunted. He was largely rejected by his own people the people among whom he grew up in Nazareth tried to kill him by throwing him off a cliff. And throughout all of this, he showed marvelous restraint in how he answered them and how he acted. In fact, in the whole record of his life, ministry, and death, there is only one instance in which we are told that Jesus became angry, and it was not over something that was done to him or said to him. We find the account in Mark 3, the first six verses. And we're going to read that from the New American Standard Version. Mark 3, 1 through 6. And he entered again into the, a synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they were watching him, that is the Pharisees and the leaders of the synagogue, to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath in order that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Rise and come forward. And he said to them, that is, the leaders of the synagogue, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. And after looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. And the Pharisees went out and immediately began taking counsel with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. This is the one and only instance in the scripture where it says Jesus was angry. <clears throat> and the word there means anger. It does mean anger. It's the only time it's used. <clears throat> but he was grieved because of the hardness of heart. He was angry that they would wish that this man would continue on with his withered hand and when he had the power to heal him. They would rather all the people continue with their suffering than break some little law of doing some work on the Sabbath. And it grieved Jesus so much that he was angry. <clears throat> what about other times? Do you think there were other times? Like when he drove the money changers out of the temple? You could see Jesus being angry. But the scriptures don't say that he was. How about when he pronounced the woes upon the scribes and Pharisees recorded in Matthew 23? I kind of always imagined Jesus you know, really laying it on with some anger. <clears throat> but the record doesn't say that he was angry. He was simply clearing his father's house of what didn't belong there. He may have been angry, but he may have not. <clears throat> he simply wanted them gone. 
And in regard to uh, Jesus pronouncing the woes on the scribes and Pharisees, Brother Russell states that Jesus said these things pityingly, sadly, not angrily. Okay. <clears throat> Jesus' perspective as the active agent of his father in creating mankind enabled him to thoroughly understand the makeup of the human mind and heart, and particularly their condition under the dominion of Satan. Consequently, he did not have any illusions, any unfounded expectations about the way that he and his message would be received. And kind of along with the lines with Brother Larry said earlier, we shouldn't have any unfounded expectations when we trot out this message when we have an opportunity to do it either. It's nice when there's a, a hearing mind or a, and heart, but uh, Jesus didn't have any unfounded expectations and neither should we. The insults and abuse did not catch him off guard, leading to an angry reaction such as similar events might do to us. But with us, it is often different. Our fallen human nature is particularly susceptible to anger and angry reactions to situations. Imagine these situations. <clears throat> you drive quite a distance to a store to purchase an appliance you've been needing for a long time because the store is finally having a sale on it. At home, you unpack the appliance, plug it in, and discover it doesn't work. Would you be a little irritated? Would you be moderately upset? Would you be quite angry? Would you be very angry? Probably we would have our own way of responding. <clears throat> How about being singled out for correction when other, the actions of others go unnoticed, such as being pulled over for speeding when there have been plenty of other cars passing you? Ever happened to anybody? Little annoyance or quite angry? How about you're talking to someone and they don't answer because you finally realize they weren't even listening to you? <clears throat> would you be just a little annoyed or would it upset you greatly? How about you accidentally make the wrong kind of turn in a parking lot and as you get out of your car someone yells at you, where did you learn to drive? It's happened. How about you had a difficult day at work and the moment you get home and in the house your spouse starts to complain about how you forgot to do something that you had promised to do? How about you're at a convention and it's meal time? Hopefully this didn't happen. <laughs> you're walking down the aisle between tables to an empty seat that you have spotted and Suddenly, someone already seated without looking stands up and pushes back their chair into you, causing your plate of saucy spaghetti <laughs> to dump down the front of your suit or dress. I've seen this happen at a convention. I don't think it was spaghetti, but it was the plate full of food. How about you're a speaker at a convention? You gave your discourse the previous period, and now the next speaker is giving a very unambiguous rebuttal to the main point of your talk. <laughs> Had it happen. <clears throat> I was probably at least a little annoyed. <clears throat> How about when other people are present, somebody loudly accuses you of something you didn't do. It's simply untrue. I imagine all of us at one time or another have experienced most of these circumstances or some of them. Did you get angry? at least inside a little bit? Why might we get angry in these circumstances? Well, we might feel inconvenienced by the circumstances, that it is an unwelcome intrusion into our time, or that it has wasted our time, like driving to that store and coming home with something that didn't work. <clears throat> Pride might be involved. We might feel that our self-worth has been attacked. If the matter happened in a public setting, we might feel embarrassed or humiliated, triggering an angry feeling within us. 
We might feel that the criticism directed at us is unjustified, unfair, or simply unnecessary. Do situations like this make us angry? Or is anger an emotion and mode of acting or speaking that we choose in irritating and unsettling, upsetting circumstances? Here's an excerpt from Barnes Notes on the New Testament. Anger is a passion too common to need any description. It is an excitement or agitation of mind produced by the reception of a real or supposed injury and attended commonly with a desire or purpose of revenge. The desire of revenge, however, is not essential to the existence of the passion, though it is probably always attended with a disposition to express displeasure, to chide, rebuke, or to punish. Whether we realize it or not, anger is a choice. Unfortunately, it is a choice that human nature makes so quickly and automatically in irritating circumstances that we don't realize we've made a choice. We may not even have been aware that we could make a different choice. Anger is a learned behavior. The tendency and habit is to not put in too much thought before choosing feelings of anger or an angry response. In irritating circumstances, anger usually becomes an automatic choice unless we invest a considerable amount of time, energy, and thought into making a habit of not automatically choosing anger in those situations so that we can thoughtfully choose among other options for responding, speaking, and acting. I think that in Jesus' case, when he was insulted, taunted, or threatened, he quickly considered his options and selected the best actions and words to make a pointed lesson out of the situation. And from the record, it seems he rarely made that choice to choose anger. Only one time that we have in the record. So let's look at what scriptural guidance we have in regard to anger. But first, a disclaimer. We are going to examine the scriptural counsel to us in regard to anger. There is another whole realm of anger that is discussed in the scripture, and that's God's anger and wrath. And that is not our topic, and we are not going to explore it. But we do want to say that we want to be clear that God's anger with sin and evil does not create any contradiction to the scriptural guidance that we are given about how we are to manage and deal with anger. It does not mitigate God's counsel. It does not justify us acting contrary to what God's word teaches us on the subject of handling anger. The first, we're going to look at a number of them. I'm just going to read through uh, quite a series here. Psalm 4.4 says, reading this time from NIV, In your anger do not sin. When you are on your beds, Search your hearts and be silent. The New King James Version of that same verse says, Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Psalm 37 verses 8 and 9 says, Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it only leads to evil. For evil men will be cut off, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. Proverbs 15.1, very familiar passage to us. A soft anger turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Another familiar one from Proverbs 16.32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Proverbs 22. 24 and 25, do not associate with a man given to anger or go with a hot-tempered man or you will learn his ways and find a snare for yourself. You see, anger is modeled by people around us and we kind of pick that up as an early, at an early age and that's where we, we learn anger. It's a learned behavior. 
Galatians 5, 18 to 22, reading from New American Standard. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like that, of which I war forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I think that says dealing with anger and managing it is important. Familiar passage in James 1, 19 and 20. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to learn, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteousness that God's, does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. And we remember the passage in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. You have heard that it was said of them of old time, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, oops, I'm reading from the King James. Guess what? Without a cause is not in the original. You read it in any other translation, <laughs> that, uh, that rationa rationale is gone. It does not say without a cause. It says, whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of judgment. You don't get an out say, well, but he gave me a reason. There was a good reason for it. It's not in the scriptures, brother. It's not there. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of Gehenna. I'm going to read that from Philip's, that same passage. You have heard that it was said to the people of, in the old days, thou shalt not murder and anyone who does so must stand his trial. But I say to you that anyone who is angry with his brother must stand his trial. Anyone who contemptuously calls his brother a fool must face the Supreme Court. And anyone who looks down on his brother as a lost soul is himself heading straight for the fire of destruction. So it really matters how we look at our brethren and whether what our feelings are toward them. And finally, we want to look at Ephesians, the fourth chapter, um, verses, uh, uh, we're going to read, uh, mm, just, I guess, verse 26 and then 31 and 32. Uh, 26 is the one that we want to focus in on. <clears throat> Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. In Philip's translation, it says, if you are angry, oh, well, I was going to read 31 and 32, excuse me. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Verse 26 in the Phillips translation. If you are angry, be sure that it is not out of wounded pride or bad temper. Never go to bed angry. Do not give the devil that sort of foothold. From the New English Bible. If you are angry, do not let anger lead you into sin. Do not let sunset find you still nursing it. Leave no loophole for the devil. And finally, from today's English version, if you become angry, do not let your anger lead you into sin, and do not stay angry all day. Now, this passage has caused me consternation for many, many years. The interpretations that I've heard or read just didn't seem to make sense or be practical. The singular interpretation I have always heard, read, and understood is that I must reconcile with the one with whom I may be upset before the end of the day. 
Here's a comment from Brother Russell. No matter what provocation we have, we should see that the matter is settled quickly. Looking in some other commentaries, Matthew Henry. If we would be angry and not sin, we must be angry at nothing but sin. And we should be more jealous for the glory of God than for any interest or reputation of our own. If you have been provoked and have had your spirits greatly discomposed, and if you have bitterly resented any affront that has been offered, before night calm, before night calm and quiet your spirits be reconciled to the offender. Uh, John Wesley's notes on the Bible says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Reprove your brother and be reconciled immediately. Uh, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, let not night and anger against anyone sleep with you, but go and conciliate the other party. And from one other commentary, it says, be reconciled ere the sun go down. As I have understood it along those lines all these years, I keep asking myself, do we really need to reconcile with the person who offended us before the day is over? Really? Is that realistic? Is it practical? Is it even feasible? If we're angry with the person who yelled at us in the parking lot, where did you learn to drive? Is it possible to be reconciled with that person by the end of the day? <laughs> we don't even know who it was or where they are. We can't talk the matter out with them. If we are angry because our supervisor at work harshly criticized us, can we reconcile with them before the end of the day? Probably not until the next work day, right? What if trying to talk it out with him or her would only make matters worse giving given his or her personality. Are we doomed to carry unresolved anger? If the source of our upset is an exchange with our spouse, he or she is probably readily available for reconciliation, eh, but the hurt and feelings of both parties may be rather raw at the end of the day. Is reconciliation possible? Or the issue may be one that cannot be resolved before the end of the day because it requires much work to change a situation or set of circumstances to resolve it. In this case, must the anger or exasperation be carried by the two parties until all of that work is accomplished in future days? Reconciliation before the day is over just doesn't seem feasible or realistic in such circumstances. To me, it would seem that Reconciliation is much more likely after we have gotten past our feelings of hurt and anger. And that might not be by the end of the day. After we have released our resentment toward the offender. And maybe it requires sleeping on it for a night and then refreshed by a night's sleep, seeing the matter from a fresh perspective the next day. So that's what seems realistic to me. So do I just set aside Paul's counsel, thinking I know better? Or is the apostle saying something different than I previously understood from this passage? Well, through study, brethren, I believe that Paul is talking about what we do and only about what we do within our own heart before the end of the day. It is not that we have to reconcile with the offender. We must reconcile our own feelings of resentment and anger. Maybe you all already have this understanding. It's just taken me 45 years to get there. <clears throat> but I've never heard a talk on this before, so. <laughs> um, we must release our feelings of hostility, resentment, or ill will toward anyone who has offended us or in some way provoked us to choose anger in response to their actions or words. Basically, we have to forgive the offender in our hearts before the end of the day, so that laying down on our beds, we can be calm and silent. This often means processing the events and facts 
until we gain a perspective that enables our hearts to arrive at a completely comfortable forgiveness toward the one who may have offended us. That may be what is meant in that Psalm 44 passage. Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. We should come to that point. Reprint 483, an article said, Be Ye Angry. Read a short excerpt here that says, This is the counsel of Brother Paul. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. That is, let not your anger amount to bitterness, malice, hatred, but let it be only such as is controlled by love. Neither give place to the devil. Let not truth fall in the streets and error triumph over it. Sometimes, brethren, there is a justified reason for choosing to display the emotion of anger. Sometimes anger in our voices and in our body language is useful in communicating to another how seriously they have injured or offended us or how great a danger the other person created by what they did. In such cases, the purpose of the anger is to more effectively communicate an important message or lesson to the other person. This is a holy and righteous purpose for choosing anger. It is for the other person's benefit or someone else's benefit. Anger should not be chosen because somehow it feels good to us to spout off to them. That's not a holy purpose. Barnes Notes has some good counsel on this subject, on this verse. It says, anger is sinful in the following circumstances. So this kind of goes along with, when is it not right? <laughs> One, when it is excited without any sufficient cause, when we are in no danger, and do not need it for protection. Two, when it transcends the cause, if any cause really exists. All that is beyond the necessity of immediate self-protection is apart from its design and it is wrong. Three, when it is against the person rather than the offense. The object is not to injure another, it is to protect ourselves. Four, when it is attended with the desire of revenge, this is always wrong. Five, when it is cherished and heightened by reflection. And six, when there is an unforgiving spirit, a determination to exact the utmost satisfaction for the injury which has been done. The meaning of the whole of this verse then is, if you be angry, which may be the case, and which may be unavoidable, see that the sudden excitement does not become sin. Do not let it overlap its proper bounds. Do not cherish it. Do not let it remain in your bosom even to the setting of the sun. Though the sun be sinking in the west, let not the passion linger in the bosom, but let the sun's last rays find you always peaceful and calm. Clark's commentary says, if you do get angry with anyone, see that the fire be cast with the utmost speed out of your bosom. Do not go to sleep with any unkind or unbrotherly feeling. Anger continued in may produce malice and revenge. And another commentator, it should not last at the furthest more than a day, that when the heat of the day is over, the heat of anger should likewise be over, and that we should not sleep with it, lest it should be cherished and increased in our pillows. And besides, the time of the going down of the sun is the time of the evening prayer, which may be greatly interrupted and hindered by anger. So I have appreciated studying this and coming to a new way of looking at this for myself. And I thought I would share that. You know, the forgiving person is sometimes caricatured as weak and spineless. 
But just the opposite is true. One must be strong to forgive. Forgiving is not always easy. It can be very, very hard. Consider the families of the Amish girls who were murdered in their schoolhouse in Nichols Mines, Pennsylvania in 2006. That very day, a group of the Amish went to the home of the shooter's widow. He had taken his own life to tell his wife that they forgave Charlie and that they would hold no grudge against her or her family. Although their forgiveness seemed incredulous to her, they explained that their forgiveness was not about Charlie. It was about them, the victims, releasing any resentment so that hatred and bitterness had no room to take root in their hearts. I'd like to share another story that I ran across recently. It makes an interesting, insightful point. The writer says, I talked with a young man who had recently made a decision of faith and had turned the controls of his life over to God. He had grown up an orphan. His opportunities had been narrow, and he, had been, he grew up with a chip on his shoulder. He said, I could never get along with my bosses, and I especially despised my foreman. He seemed to have it in for me, and I was itching for revenge. But since I was now trying to be a Christian, I just started to start praying every day. I prayed for my family, I prayed for my neighbors, and then I gritted my teeth and prayed for the foreman. And do you know what? When I started doing that, something changed in that guy. It wasn't but a few weeks until he had changed, and we're now the best of friends. Of course, he smiled. I guess I was the one who changed the most. God can change you, the writer went on, if you will ask him. If the memory system of your mind has stored up bitterness and revenge and malice, Christ wants to come in and erase that for you and give you love instead. Christ is something of an expert in the art of forgiving, for it was he who said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. When we give others the freedom to be imperfect and make mistakes, even mistakes that affect us, it frees us from the need to be a judge, and then we can find it rather easy to forgive those mistakes that do affect us, even if they affect us tragically. What perspectives make it easy to forgive or to not take offense in the first place? I like what Pastor Russell says about not taking any offense in the first place. This is on reprint page 2296. The Christian is to have the loving, generous disposition of heart, a copy of the Heavenly Father's disposition. In trivial affairs, he is to have so much sympathy and love that he will take no notice. Just as God, for Christ's sake, deals with us and does not impute sin to us, except as it represents knowledge and willfulness. With such a rule operating amongst Christians, a determination not to recognize an offense, anything that is not purposely done or intended as an offense, would be a great blessing to all and the proper godlike course. Proverbs 19.11 goes along with that. It says, a man's wisdom gives him patience and it is to his glory to overlook an offense. What this makes very clear to us is that one of the freedoms we have in life is to choose not to be offended by words or actions of others that would normally stir up angry thoughts or reactions in us. We can do this even when the other person purposely intended to offend us. We can choose not to be offended. What perspectives can help us find the strength to forgive others, even when the harm they may have done seems great? First, we can acknowledge our own imperfections and refuse to make comparisons between ourself and the offender. 1 Corinthians 4.4 says, My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. 
that even if we think we have a clear conscience and we are doing very well, we're not completely innocent. We can consider how much God has forgiven us and he did it before we even asked for it. Jesus came and paid the penalty. The debts of others to us for their offenses are so small compared to the enormous debt we are forgiven by God. And this is brought out in the parable of the two debtors in Matthew 18. We can remember, as a dear sister once told me, <laughs> Sister Molly, remember that Jesus died to save the offender too. And in saying that to me, she saved me from hate that was deep in my heart for someone. Remember that we ourselves need forgiveness from others and from God repeatedly. Remember that the permission of evil is part of God's plan. And realize that the offend, what the offender did actually was not about you. Even if it was directed at you. It was more about him or her, their feelings, their anger, their emotions, their needs. And we can try to understand what they might have been going through that led them to speak or act that way. Here's a few quotations about forgiving that I have found helpful. Forgiving is rediscovering the shining path of peace that at first you thought others took away when they betrayed you. They can't take it away from us by what they do if it's deep within our heart. Life becomes easier when you learn to accept an apology you never get. Sometimes no one is going to apologize for what they've done. We can still forgive them. That's the counsel of Brother Russell in that same article, reprint 2296. Forgive them even if they won't recognize what they have done. And this one I like. I know it's, it's a little different, but it says, with a little time and a little more insult, we begin to see both ourselves and our enemies in humbler profiles. We are not really as innocent as we felt when we were first hurt. And we do not usually have a gigantic monster forgive. We have a weak, needy, and perhaps somewhat stupid human being. When you see your enemy and yourself in the weakness and silliness of the humanity that you share, you will make the miracle of forgiving a little easier. We're all struggling with the same things. So I'd like to just close with this passage from Colossians 3. I'm going to read verses, verse 8 and 12 through 14. I'm reading out of NIV. Colossians 3, verse 8 and 12 to 14. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. You must rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. Brethren, I hope sharing these things might have been useful. Again, maybe you were already there and I'm just finally catching up on this important lesson. But my prayer for all of us is that we may learn to graciously forgive those who offend us before the end of the day, before the day is over. And that over time we might find it easier and easier to do so. May we also learn to be the master of our anger and our emotions, not its slave, 
and reserve the use of anger for times when there is a wise and a holy purpose to do so. May the Lord bless us all. I want to thank Brother Tom for the beautiful lesson and the scriptures and uh, for showing us that anger and forgiveness are opposite. They both can't stand at the same time. It's one or the other. May we always uh, have that forgiving heart.